This is a police station in China's most restive province. In the car park, paramilitaries are training to fight Islamic terrorists. Their opponents, we're told, have killed more than a hundred people in pursuit of a separate fundamentalist state. China has long kept this fight out of public view, not wishing to dent its image of national harmony. Now it wants the world to know, because this, officials claim, is China's battleground in the war on terror. But human rights groups claim it is simply a war on freedom. It is clear that the current campaign is essentially a campaign against dissent and opposition. Xinjiang lies at the far west of China, in the heartland of Islamic Central Asia. For centuries, it's been a crossroads of civilizations. Traders passed here along a branch of the ancient Silk Road. Local kingdoms rose and fell. Most of its people are ethnic Uyghurs, descendants of desert nomads. Few Uyghurs speak or even understand Chinese, but since 1949 they've been ruled by communist China. This is China's other Tibet, a land with a distinct culture, language and sense of nationhood. A people who, depending on your point of view, were either invaded or liberated by Chinese communists. It's always been an uneasy coexistence, with some refusing to bend to Beijing's will. But now China has every excuse to deal with the troublemakers once and for all. The reason is September 11th. Ever since the attacks on America, China has likened its campaign in Xinjiang to America's war in Afghanistan. It has painted separatists as terrorists linked to Osama bin Laden. And it's backed America's military response, declaring itself a partner in a common fight. Former US President George Bush Sr., speaking recently in China, delivered a grateful nation's thanks. Everybody in the United States of America is grateful to China for standing with the United States in this war against terror. We are very grateful. America's actions have been a green light for China to intensify its anti-separatist drive. Since September 11th, Chinese security forces have arrested thousands of suspected dissidents. Mosques have been brought under tight communist control. Human rights groups are banned here, but relying on smuggled personal accounts and official Chinese reports, they have pieced together a picture of overwhelming repression. We believe that thousands of people have been detained their cases are held entirely in secrecy. Um, they uh, often are tortured. As I said, torture is widespread in the region, uh, particularly against political prisoners. Uh, and they are, they are denied all basic rights to a fair trial. Journalists are normally banned from here too. We were brought on the first government tour of the province in two years. The authorities keen to counter foreign criticism of the anti-terrorist campaign. Our first stop, the capital of Urumqi, for a meeting with Xinjiang's most powerful man, the Communist Party Secretary, Wang Lechan. <laughs> 
Amnesty International says that you have used September 11th as an excuse to crack down on dissidents. It's, it's not about terrorism. To prove it, we were shown videos of terrorist acts blamed on Uyghur separatists. Xinjiang has been rocked with riots and periodic bombing since the 1980s. The worst in February 1997 killed nine people. Authorities admit there have been no major attacks since, but China maintains separatists could be planning a new campaign, with hundreds returning from Al-Qaeda training camps in neighboring Afghanistan. Zhang For five days, we were taken by bus across more than 1,200 kilometers of Xinjiang's deserts. The aim was to show us how China is bringing stability and prosperity to the region. Authorities believe they have a good story to tell here, but it was the only story they wanted us to hear. At every stop, we were shadowed by uniformed and plainclothes police. Some police filmed us with clumsily concealed cameras. Others were dropped a short distance away before casually blending in with us. Their aim to prevent us meeting anyone not sanctioned for interview. In town after town, communist officials refused to let us move freely. But the message from every official was the same. Only foreign fanatics were calling for independence the Uyghurs and other ethnic groups were happy to live with their Chinese brothers. To China's credit, it has strived to develop what was once a backward province. It has built schools, hospitals and roads, created millions of jobs and laboured to exploit Xinjiang's rich energy resources. The latest project, and one of the biggest ever, a 4,000 kilometre pipeline to take Xinjiang's gas to Shanghai. Chinese have come from the east to help them build. Millions from the main Chinese ethnic group, the Hans. But the Han Chinese party secretary insists the benefits have been shared with all. But the influx of Chinese has done more to fuel resentment than any foreign fanatics. Hans already outnumber Uyghurs in the capital Urumqi. At present rates, Xinjiang's 8 million Uyghurs will soon be a minority in their own land. Many claim the Chinese get the senior posts, the best jobs, and nearly all the money. The level of unemployment among, for example, the Uyghur population is extremely high. For those who are lucky enough to find a job in the new industries, usually they are offered menial jobs. And this is in, in itself is, is creating tension between the two communities. 
To find out for ourselves, we slipped away from our minders to try to speak to Uyghurs first hand. The police were waiting for us. No matter how many times we switched taxis or changed direction, there were always police cars or mysterious unmarked cars on our tail. It's not unusual to be followed in China. What was strange is that they made no attempt to stop us or arrest us. They just openly followed us. The clear message was that if we tried to stop to interview anyone, they'd be right behind us. But in guarded conversations with taxi drivers, we gained a brief glimpse of life behind the official veil, a glimpse that doesn't support the official line. But we couldn't push them further. Before long, police were stopping the drivers to see what they'd told the foreigners. The next day, officials told us it was all part of making Xinjiang safe. No Uyghur can publicly criticise China's policies. Xinjiang is technically an autonomous province, but that only gives it the right to retain its languages and customs. As in the rest of China, opposition parties are banned and the communists' power is absolute. Hello, but there is one institution of Uyghur culture that China fears as a potential threat, the mosque. Since September 11th, China has cracked down hard on Islam. Muslim clerics have been sent to compulsory political education classes. Uyghurs were even banned from fasting during the holy month of Ramadan. Human rights groups claim hundreds of mosques have been shut down. The wearing of headscarves for women or certain types of clothing for men is being frowned upon. People who do not conform with what is expected from them by their employers may lose their jobs. Yet for all this, China insists it gives complete religious freedom. We were taken to its showpiece in the city of Kucha. Not just any mosque, but as this plaque proclaims, a national model mosque. All the worshippers were adults. People under 18 are banned from practicing or studying Islam and most were old men. The Imam presented for interview, 71-year-old Abdul Rashid, praised the party's religious policy. We later tried to speak to him away from officials. The interview was immediately stopped. Xinjiang has a huge security apparatus to keep malcontents in line. The city's team with soldiers and police. 
Officials deny there has been a build-up since September 11th. But they stopped us when we tried to film an army convoy. Yeah, it was time to go to our next showpiece venue. After four days, we were finally to get the chance to speak to ordinary Uyghurs. The bus brought us to what we were promised would be a typical Uyghur village. Every effort had been taken to prepare for our visit. The road was freshly sealed, the houses cleaned, and the residents primed. It seemed this was, in fact, a model village. Inside, we found a folk group, dancers, and happy village folk. This is the image China likes to give of its minority ethnic groups, but it felt more like a theme park than reality. The dancers had been brought in from the city. They told us they performed here for visiting foreigners all the time. The village elder presented for interview, 79-year-old Tursan Bharat, spoke in terms that could have been scripted for a party congress. In Xinjiang, nobody can depart from the official line that all live happily and equally under the Communist Party's benevolent rule. Xinjiang separatists are by definition terrorists with nothing to resort to but violence. It is a criminal offence to even argue for a separate state, no matter how quietly or peacefully. The authorities simply won't allow any middle ground. By the end of our trip, we were little wiser as to whether there was a genuine terrorist threat or whether it was simply an excuse for continued repression. It was clear China is committed to developing the region while preserving at least the outward signs of Uyghur culture. But it was also clear the authorities' first instincts remain authoritarian and that truth must be tailored to the party line. <laughs> <laughs>